aftermath of a wildfire. When you first get there, it's it's a pretty shocking, um, it's a shocking sight. Can be striking in its destruction. It effectively devastated everything from the soil up, the seed banks up for a large continuous area. That's Matthew Agai, chief science officer for a company called Mast Reforestation. And he sees hope among the blackened trees and ashen landscapes. We're looking at these hellscapes. Um, with a degree of optimism. The company is taking a new approach to restoring burned forests. Our goal is to use a pathway to um, uh, reforestation, basically, to mitigate the worst effects of climate change. It's a lofty goal, but the company is already showing early signs of success. In 2020, the Labor Day fires that swept across Oregon scorched nearly 175,000 acres in the Willamette National Forest. Among the burned areas was the Henry Creek watershed, east of Malala. One of the biggest hurdles to reforestation is the cost, and that's where MAST approaches the problem a little differently. Trees are capable of storing large amounts of carbon dioxide, one of the primary drivers of climate change. And MAST sells carbon credits to people and companies looking to offset their emissions, essentially canceling out the carbon emitted from smokestacks with the carbon stored in trees. That allows the company to offer restoration to landowners at steep discounts. The Henry Creek Project is um, kind of the perfect case study for the type of work that Mass does. But of course, you can't replant a forest without trees. And that's where a 150-year-old company called Silvaseed comes in. Silvaseed is one of the largest private seed extractories and facilities uh, in the Western United States. Kia Woodruff is the general manager. Uh, the only way to get seed for regrowing forest is to go out in the forest and collect that seed. The cones start in one position here at the front. They first come in as cones, which are sent through a kiln to open the scales and release the seeds. Then they go through a series of machines that brush and shake the seeds to sort and clean them. We do this for a random sample of 100 seeds on every lot. Once they're tested in a lab for viability, they're ready to plant. The media is wrapped in a piece of biodegradable paper. Um, and it just gives a little bit of extra protection to the roots, a little bit easier to handle. This assembly line can produce up to 136,000 seedlings each day. And they all end up just down the road in Silva Seeds greenhouses. I asked Woodruff how many are in each greenhouse. Maybe a million. She said it's not easy work, but it does have its rewards. Every single time there's a fire, it's like, okay, who are the people that are going to be affected by this fire? Um, and what resources can we can we you know bring to bear on that? More than 160,000 of those seedlings have made their way out to the 300 acres on the Henry Creek project. Some were dropped in seed bucks by heavy lift drones. Others were planted the old-fashioned way. And the trees that were planted resulted in offsetting more than 200,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide, according to MAST. That's the equivalent of canceling out the yearly emissions of more than 47,000 cars. As soon as they're put in the ground, they're accumulating carbon and creating wood. And uh, that's something we want to protect and create resilience for on a very long decadal, century-long timeline. There are some skeptics of using reforestation to offset carbon emissions, though. Grayson Badgley is a research scientist with a group called Carbon Plan. Yeah, so Carbon Plan is a nonprofit that we use the tools of open science and data to make sure that we're focusing on climate solutions that work. And Badgley's skepticism lies in the very nature of offsets. You burn some fossil fuel and you add that carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. But you trade that for the promise of a good thing happening somewhere else. Carbon dioxide can persist in the atmosphere for hundreds of years or even longer. And trees are inherently temporal, sometimes dying naturally, other times wiped out en masse by things like wildfires. And if they die and release that carbon back into the atmosphere, then nothing has really been offset at all. If there's an imbalance between the harm done to the atmosphere and the good done to the atmosphere, what we end up with is the atmosphere actually being in a worse place than if we had just sort of gone directly and regulated those emissions straightforward. You know, Still, a guy was confident in the company's um, plan over the long term. We think about the individual or stand, of course, there's going to be dynamism. Trees 
fall down. Um, new trees are going to grow when we plant more trees. They're going to rep- uh, reproduce. And he said that the more trees that can be planted, the more resilient they'll be to wildfire and the more confidence buyers will have in carbon credits. As soon as we do that at a very large scale, we start to see that the impact and the resilience are much better. The outlook is much better and it should create confidence in these markets. But a guy also knows it'll take more than just reforestation to fully combat the impacts of climate change in the West. The future uh, of the Western landscape is really dependent on this combination of tending to natural systems that have a natural resilience, but also working as fast as we can to quickly recover these these hellscapes or these moonscapes. Kale Williams, KGW News. Kale's with me now. And Kale, interesting story, but I'm wondering what's the difference between this and like Weyerhaeuser doing a clear cut and then replanting, you know, thousands of trees there? Yeah, well, you know, I can't speak specifically to Weyerhaeuser, but I know that a lot of timber companies, when they do replanting, they're often replanting the exact same species of tree. So you get this monoculture of something like Douglas fir, because it's a pretty profitable timber to harvest. But when they're doing this up for the mast project, they're planting all kinds of different trees that are specifically suited to that area. The other thing that's a little bit different is that timber companies are often replanting those trees with the intent of harvesting them. They have them on sometimes 50 or 60 year rotations where they'll replant, let them grow, and then cut them down again. This area up in Henry Creek has a conservation easement of at least 100 years that this stuff is gonna be taken care of. And do the experts really think it's gonna counter climate change? Well, I mean, you heard from that expert in the piece, Grayson Badgley from Carbon Plan, and you know, there are questions about it, but I think what it really comes down to is that to actually fight the climate crisis, we need to not just be offsetting carbon emissions, we need to be eliminating them through things like electrification and things like that. Obviously, we're not quite where we need to be there yet, and so this is a stopgap for the meantime. All right, and I can see that you're not out in a forest. We've been able to grab you when you're in the middle of another story. Tell us about where you're at and what's going on there. That's right, Pat. I'm out at Cannon Beach. You might see Haystack Rock behind me. We're bound here, out here today reporting on these mysterious tar balls that have been washing up on the Oregon and Washington coasts. They started last week up by Long Beach, and since then they've been washing up all the way down to Lincoln City. And these things, they're, they're small, you know, between the size of a dime up to the size of a sand dollar, but we don't know a lot about them. The officials told me today that we don't really know where they're coming from, exactly how widespread they are, or even what they're made out of. But what we do know is that they are causing some big problems for wildlife. We've had 10 birds at least that have been found covered in oil and four of them have died. And uh, do you think that there's more wildlife than just the ones we've seen? I I would guess the answer is yes. Yeah, I mean, we saw evidence of that today. When we first came down to the beach here in Cannon Beach earlier today, we saw a dead myrrh floating in the surf, and it looked like it might have had oil on it. So we took a picture of it, and I took it up to some wildlife experts who have been doing some rehab for some of these birds, and they said that it looked like it was probably covered in oil. So I think the damage from this is probably a lot more widespread than just, you know, the four dead birds that we've heard about. Oh, my. Well, that is worrisome. All right. Thanks, Kale, for being on top of it. Appreciate both your stories there. Now, if you have any thoughts on Kale's story today, our series all this week, or that tar mystery out on the coast, send them our way. Email us, will you? The address is the story at KGW.com or call and leave a voicemail. The number is 503-226-5090.